Brought to you by the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver. Standards Matter, a podcast about professionalism and accountability in real estate. The following scenario is inspired by a real professional conduct case. Some details have been altered for storytelling purposes, and we've removed all identifying information to respect the privacy of those involved. It was William Hunt's luck that there'd be an accident on Lougheed Highway. It was well past dinner time, and every second he spent on the highway was another second he'd miss before his kid's bedtime. William was exhausted. It had been a marathon day of showing homes and meeting with clients. But more than anything, he couldn't stop thinking about a problem buyer that chewed him out the night before. It was nagging at him. For sure, there was a communication issue, he thought. He went over everything that happened, tracing the steps to see what he could have done to prevent these issues. He could have been clear that the deal wasn't firm and that it wouldn't be until all parties agreed to the terms in writing. Visions of a warm meal, his loving partner, and his kids danced through his head as he inched his way towards the suburban home. (sighs) That was until his phone rang. It was his colleague, Pete Dolmayan. He spoke with Pete earlier that day, looking for a referral for a tradesperson for his client. Pete was probably following up to see if he'd been in contact, William thought. Pete was always in the ball with stuff like that. Are you watching the news? Pete asked. The question confused William. He explained that he was stuck in traffic. Besides, he hardly ever watched the evening news. It was too depressing. Well, I think you should. Your listing's on it, Pete replied. It wasn't long before William cut through the traffic and arrived home. After greeting his family, he slipped into his den and pulled up the local news station website on his laptop. There, on the front page, was the home he listed in Coquitlam, complete with his for sale sign prominently out front. Above the picture, you could see the name, William Hunt Weller & Co. Realty. The article's headline read, Realtors Using Loophole to Get Out of Deals. Welcome to the Standards Matter podcast, brought to you by the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver. I'm your host, Andrea Westaway. In each episode, we explore scenarios inspired by real professional conduct in arbitration cases to give you practical insight on how to strengthen professionalism in real estate and serve your clients better. Our professional standards advisors vet and approve all information in this podcast. This episode, we look at the professional conduct process. How does the professional conduct committee come to their decisions? How do they decide the proper punishment? And how do they weigh the damage done by misconduct with the consequences to the parties involved? Now, back to the case. Diana Spector had been a realtor with Silhouette Realty for a decade. While she struggled her first few years in the business, her career saw an incredible upward trajectory since switching to commercial real estate. She had a knack for it, and her MBA gave her insight into the business world. A few years ago, when she started, she was selling storefronts and small business leases in the suburbs. Now she was negotiating multi-million dollar deals for office buildings downtown. She was a rising star at Silhouette. Her managing broker and mentor, Lisa Chen, had been recognizing her efforts more and more. This newfound success meant that Diana had the cash flow to pay off her student loans, get married, and save for a down payment on her first home. She was excited to leave her renter's life in the city and move back to the suburbs to start the next phase of her life. But not all was well in Diana's world. While more business meant more money, it also meant less time. She was running ragged for her clients, and while her husband was understanding, the pace of business was still putting a strain on their relationship. A busy market also meant she was having a hard time finding a home that met her needs. She wanted a home in Coquitlam, around where she grew up, but pickings were slim. Anytime a suitable home came onto the market, it was snatched up. Compounding this was Diana's mother. Her health was fading, and ever since Diana's father passed, needed more care. Sure, she could find a care home for her mother, but that was the last resort. She could handle it, she thought. Her mother deserved that. These factors were weighing on Diana. She was getting short with her husband and was starting to let small details slip at work. Nothing damaging yet, but it was enough to put her on edge. Diana needed a win in her personal life. So, when she came across a Vancouver special in her old neighborhood on the MLS, she was determined to get it. The place was perfect, not too big or small, enough room, and a beautiful kitchen. 
The bottom floor had been converted to a secondary suite and had no tenant. This meant her mother could live with her. It was almost too good to be true. She called her realtor, Serge Seng of Cube Realty, to arrange a showing. Being a realtor, Diana knew the value of proper representation. Serge came highly recommended and they hit it off right away. It didn't take long for her to sign an agency agreement with him, officially starting her home hunting journey. That was a year and a half ago, and things had changed since then. While she felt Serge was hands-on in the beginning, the past 18 months saw the market reach a fevered pace, and in her mind, Serge began giving her less attention. They had a dozen offers rejected and countless showings, tours, and opens. Now he seemed to avoid her calls. But this time, he picked up right away. Hello? To his credit, Serge was quick and set up a showing for the following day. Things moved quickly from there. Diana and her husband loved the place in person and asked to make an offer at asking. Serge cracked his laptop in the car, tethered it to his phone, and put together an offer, firing it off to the listing realtor, William Hunt. William called to confirm that he received it and told Serge he was going to present it to his client. An agonizing few hours passed. Diana and her husband were back downtown, and Serge was at his office waiting for a reply. Then the phone rang. It was William. Serge tried not to sound too eager. After exchanging pleasantries, Serge and William got down to business. William Seller was positive towards the offer, but needed to change some clauses and subjects. The changes weren't major in either realtor's mind. William said that he needed to confirm this counteroffer with the seller, but it would likely be enough if Diana approved. Serge was ecstatic. He hung up and called Diana right away. It's yours, as long as you agree to some of their terms, he explained. Then he went over the counteroffer with Diana. Diana and her husband didn't hesitate. Their answer was a resounding, yes, we'll agree to their terms. Serge congratulated them and told them he'd follow up with William to get the counteroffer as soon as possible. He called up William, but the line was busy. He left a message saying his clients were willing to accept and to send the counter. Diana and her husband shed tears of joy. After so long, they found their perfect home. Time to celebrate. They dressed up and made their way to their favorite restaurant, but it wasn't the dining experience they expected. Diana received a text from Serge. Would you consider increasing your offer, it read? Diana was confused. They had a verbal agreement. She had accepted the seller's terms. Why was this changing now? She found a quiet area to call Serge. Another offer came in, he explained, and it was over asking. Diana was at a breaking point. She went off, detailing every part of Serge's business that she was unhappy with. Texts instead of calls, the slow responses to her messages, the failure after failure of negotiation, all of it. Serge sat in silence. He understood her frustration, and he knew from past experience that sometimes his job was to listen. When she was done, he apologized and tried to explain the situation. There was no written deal, and the seller's realtor was ultimately responsible to his seller. And if another better offer came in, it was the realtor's fiduciary duty to do what was best for their client. Diana hung up, but she wasn't done. Instead, she called William Hunt, the seller's realtor, giving him a similar treatment. William explained that there was no contract signed, only a verbal agreement. The other offer had come in not long after he spoke with Serge. He apologized, but there was nothing he could do. Diana was livid. She hung up and stormed back to her table. The dinner was ruined, and she and her husband hurried home. Before bed, she vented one last time, this time on social media. Her post wasn't long, but it got some likes. The validation made her feel good, and she drifted off to sleep. The next day, Diana received a call. It was a reporter from the local news station. He saw her post and asked to interview her. She thought about it briefly, considering the rules of cooperation and the realtor code. As long as she didn't name anyone in particular, she thought, there shouldn't be an issue. She agreed, and the news crew met her nearby. The interview went well, she thought. The reporter asked for a few more details after the camera went away. Out of curiosity, he asked, what home did you put an offer on? Diana gave him the address, but asked him not to publish any of this. He agreed, but mentioned that he wanted to get footage of the neighborhood to give the report more flavor. 
Diana agreed as long as he didn't mention the address, the seller, or the seller's realtor. Later that evening, Diana was excited to see herself on TV. But it wasn't until the end of the piece that she realized what she'd done. The camera crew had shot footage of the neighborhood, sure. But the actual home she put an offer on was featured prominently, including Williams for sale sign. Soon after it aired, she got a call from Lisa, her broker. Williams' broker was looking to file a complaint at the board over her interview. Diana was shocked. How could he file a complaint? She wasn't the realtor involved. Lisa explained that Diana may have broken both the rules of cooperation and the realtor code. Diana's heart sank. This was a disaster. In the coming weeks, Diana received more than a few calls from clients who saw her interview. The calls began to blur together, each ending in one theme. They were uncomfortable dealing with Diana. Her clients were sophisticated business people. They knew the difference between a verbal confirmation and a contract, and they felt Diana didn't. In total, Diana lost four clients and a dozen more relationships were in jeopardy. Investigation and consent to discipline. REBGB's Professional Conduct Committee's investigative panel reviewed the case. They found that Diana had violated two rules. Realtor Code Article 26, Avoid Controversies, that states the business of a realtor shall be conducted so as to avoid controversies with other realtors. And Interpretation 26.1, that states any realtor who is aware of or involved in a controversy with another realtor resulting from the alleged misconduct or impropriety of the other realtor, should place such matters before the appropriate committee for resolution in order that the matter may be resolved in accordance with the rules and regulations of the board, association, society, or council to which the realtor belongs. Second, she violated the Rules of Cooperation, Section 6.08, Professional Conduct, which states that, A. A member shall not conduct herself nor permit her employees to conduct themselves in such a manner as to prejudice her reputation or the reputation of the board. And B. A member shall not injure falsely or maliciously, directly or indirectly, the reputation, prospects, or business of another member. The only question that remained was, what's the appropriate punishment? The PCC works like a jury. They take all facts of the case into consideration. They heard from both her and William. They understood Diana's state of mind when she violated the rules and how she felt now. They understood that she was genuinely remorseful, was going through a tough time, and that the damage to her reputation had caused her to lose business. With these factors in mind, they ordered Diana to write an official apology and required her to take courses on ethics and the rules of cooperation at her expense. Diana consented. Preventative Action We sat down with our ethics guy, Kim Spencer, to discuss what Diana could have done differently in this situation to satisfy both her clients and her professional obligations. We also asked Kim about the Professional Conduct Committee's processes to get a glimpse of how they come to their decisions. Okay, Kim, where should we start? Well, I want to start with the verbal offer thing. Okay. I'm surprised, actually, there aren't more complaints like this, frankly, because... I suspect a lot of members go back and forth via their phones or via text, communicating in information about the status of their client's offer or counteroffer. And at some point in these communications, the, uh, the two members say something like, yep, my client's accepted your offer or counteroffer, congratulations. I'll send over the documents via DocuSign or AuthentiSign in, in a while. Sometimes... That happens late at night, and they decide they'll do it the next day. So there's a reason why we have Article 6 of the Realtor Code, which is that, as everyone knows, or hopefully everyone knows, having taken the licensing course, that real estate contracts in BC are not enforceable unless they're made in writing. Hmm. Now, what we have here is we've got a verbal contract. I mean, assuming you could prove that there was a verbal contract. Now, that means that the seller can't be forced to sell a property for that price that was agreed to verbally, 
but it means that there could be a lawsuit for damages, I suppose. I mean, no one's going there. It's expensive. It's time consuming. Life's too short and all that. But, you know, this is a problem. And I think members need to understand that if they're going to go back and forth on their devices between themselves and clients and other members conveying information, they need to make sure that their clients understand absolutely that they do not have a deal until they've got a piece of paper written by both sides, signed by both sides, and agreed to and delivered. And had that happened right away, this would not have happened. So Mm. Diana could have nailed that thing down Mm. that night by saying to her agent, listen, get that paperwork over there. I want it signed tonight. Right. She didn't. So, you know, she paid a fairly big price for that oversight right away. And her agent Mm. overlooked this as well. So that's a problem. Let's get that out of the way. Sure. (laughs) Starting right off with that. So then I guess moving into the Professional Conduct Committee, um, can you kind of walk us through their process around discipline? How do they come to those decisions? Sure. Well, the hallmark of a professional association, or one of the hallmarks of it, is that you're judged by your peers. So in a profession, there's usually a committee at the association made up of a collection of your peers who listen to whatever the complaint is, the case is, decide based on their own experience and context and and whatever the rules and standards are, whether or not you've done something wrong. That's the hallmark of a profession. Another hallmark of a profession is that you don't wash dirty linen in public, Mm. which is why we have that article in the Code of Ethics requiring that if there's a complaint between two members, if someone is questioning another member's conduct, which is perfectly fine, the appropriate place to send that is to the professional conduct committee and not call up a reporter. Mm. So if a member disputes the decision that the professional conduct committee has made, is there any recourse for that? Well, there is. Professional conduct committee at the real estate board follows a principle called natural justice, which means you have the right to be heard, you have a right to know the the charges, you've got a right to speak in your defense, present your own evidence, and so forth. And that those are long-held standards. Uh, but you also have the right to appeal within natural justice. I think it's important to start off with how many different sets of eyes look at a complaint file before the thing is all said and done. Firstly, there's complaint intake. That's me. <laughs> Basically, my job is to uh, listen to the complaint, help the complaint a little bit to understand the process. If they want to go formal, they send us a letter and they sign it. There's a letter from their managing broker. And uh, we then send that to the people being complained about and ask them for written response along with any evidence. And at that point, you know, sometimes the parties have cooled down and they go, well, let's call it a day. Or or there's some action taken that, that informally resolves it with the consent of all the parties. But if one of the members continues to want to pursue their own complaint, which they're entitled to do under our constitution, the file gets sent to the committee. So at that point, I'm done with it. I have nothing, no further input into the process at all. It goes to my colleague, Arnell, who then bundles it up, ties it in a red bow, sends it off to a panel of the Professional Conduct Committee. There's two panels, panel one, panel two. The panel that looks at the complaint initially and does the investigation is not the same panel that would do the hearing if there is to be one. So you've got my eyes, you've got the first panel that does the investigation, interviews the parties, makes recommendations to the committee. And if the recommendation is that there's going to be a hearing, then the second panel is the panel that does the hearing. They have never seen the complaint or the response before the day of that hearing. So they make their decision just like a jury does. Mm -hmm. I've been on that committee when I was a realtor. You sit around in the boardroom, you discuss what happened, you talk about all the all the different influences and all the parties, what happened, what the consequences were, who was harmed, all of those different things. And if they decide that there's some guilt, they then decide on the punishment. Mm -hmm. Now, the respondent, the person being complained about, is notified. If they're unhappy, with the decision, which would be a guilty finding, if that's probably, I'm sure that's what they would be. I'm, would happy I'm sure they're happy with a, with a not guilty finding. So there's a, let's say there's a guilty finding. They are entitled to appeal that decision to the board's appeal committee. That comprises a fresh set of eyes, totally different people, longtime members who sit on that appeal committee, and they don't hear new evidence, but they look at what happened, what the decision was, And they can either support the decision made by the committee or they can overturn it. Hmm. The only other avenue open to someone who's unhappy with what the appeal committee has decided is to go to court and challenge the board's process for dealing with complaints. 
Not a great use of member monies. I wouldn't assume. Well, we have lawyers present through the process mm-hmm. to make sure that the process followed is a good one. Mm-hmm. So judges don't look at the decision and say, well, that's a bad decision. What they look at is the process. And was it fair? Did people get a chance to speak and defend themselves? And if they think the process was fair, they're not going to question the decision, or most likely they're not going to. Mm. So at that point, it's it's all over. No recourse after that. No. Okay. So today's case was all about reputation and public accusation. Obviously, there was a better way Diana could have handled this situation. How could she have handled this issue? I mean, apart from waiting for, you know, everything in writing. <laughs> a large glass of scotch, maybe. <laughs> yeah, look, it's easy to point fingers and make judgments about people when they're upset. We all do things that, well, I do. Maybe you don't. I but think most people yeah, do. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 you know, we go off the beaten track occasionally. And that's just part of what being a human being is all about. It's important to have some compassion for that. You know, the committee actually looks at that. Mm. We said that they were a judge and a jury, basically. They look at what the consequences were of what happened. And they look at you know, not only the harm caused to the people who were hurt by what happened, they look at the member and how remorseful they are and what the consequences of the situation were to them. So they're quite mindful of all the context and all those different things. You know, what could have happened? Well, what could Diana have done? Well, she could have called her managing broker the next day and said, look, I'm not happy with how this happened. I want to make a complaint about my agent. Mm. I don't think she would have made a complaint about the seller's agent. And it's pretty clear the seller's agent was doing their job, right. acting for their seller. Mm. So her buyer's agent did this thing verbally. Diana should have known better. Yeah. But she could have gone to her broker. Um, she didn't. So what she did, the next go-to place for, for many people is social media. You know, it's like standing on a ladder at Georgia and Granville with a megaphone. <laughs> Would you actually do that? Would you actually stand on a ladder with a megaphone and and say... Personally, no. (laughs) Yeah, and say what uh, what she said? Would Mm. would you say that? I think most people would say, well, I'm not going to do that. But that's what making a post on social media is doing, and you're responsible for what you say. It doesn't matter if it's a closed forum that you have to be invited to join. It's public as far as the uh, the board's concerned. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, understandable, not a great situation. She bore the consequences of it. Mm Mm-hmm. So speaking of the buyer's agent, uh, how could they have handled this differently? You mean in the negotiations? Mm, Yes, I suppose. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Eye on the ball. Come on. Article six. Mm -hmm. Put it in writing. Mm -hmm. So you convey information and you get those documents over there ASAP to get them executed and signed. Mm -hmm. Well, executed. Done. Yeah. And then delivered back to the other party. Right. Uh, and you remind your client, I mean, Diana shouldn't have had to be reminded that she has nothing until it's in writing. Right. But if Diana had been a, a regular buyer, hopefully the buyer agent would have said, listen, good news, seller's nodding, but all we have is, you know, this verbal uh, communication. It's not forcible until it's in writing. So I'm sending you the documents now, get them signed. Mm-hmm. If you want to nail this down, do it right now. So are there any other ways that members commonly violate Article 26 of the Realtor Code or the Rules of Cooperation 6.08? Well, usually it's temper or or, or something that's happened. And, you know, it feels better to get a load off your shoulders sometimes, doesn't it? You do sort of say something. She was felt validated in the story by mm-hmm. making this post about her awful situation and others weighed in, well, so sorry to hear it. It makes, it makes you feel better. Right. But it damages the reputation of the profession. Makes us all look bad. It's a responsibility that members have. Don't wash dirty linen in public. Take it to the board. Yeah. So finally, if you are on the other side of the situation and a fellow member is speaking publicly about a professional dispute with you, how should you handle it? Well, try to, I would reach out to the other member and just have a talk with them. It might be that they had a bad day. Mm -hmm. And they might go, oh, golly, I'm I'm sorry, I I should, you know, and you you would ask them to to retract it, Mm -hmm. possibly. If it's been done on social media, often members resolve things. I don't hear about those ones because they get resolved. They don't come to the board. Mm -hmm. Those are two professional adults dealing with a situation. And most people have have good heart and good faith. So they get dealt with. But it can go bad, as it did in this case. Mm -hmm. Just one last thing, a PS. Oh, PS. I know it was in the back of my mind and Mm. I forgot about it. Listen, the media are wonderful folks, but they aren't your friend. No. They are not your friend. You are on the record from the moment your lips start moving, 
with someone from the media and they will do background investigations. And the fact that this property became visible and the seller's agent and all the rest of it, once you let that horse out of the barn, you have no control over it. Right. It's done. So I'm sure they're lovely people. I wouldn't be picking up the phone to talk to the media. All right. That's good advice. Thank you so much, Kim. <laughs> okay. That's a wrap on episode five of Standards Matter. I've been your host, Andrea Westaway. We plan to regularly produce new segments to engage you in conversations about standards, accountability, and professionalism in real estate. If you have a question for us, reach out to us on REBGB's member Facebook group or shoot us an email at standardsmatter at rebgv.org. For more information on professionalism, including our conduct and arbitration cases, visit our member website at www.rebgv.ca. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Standards Matter. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate us and subscribe in your favorite podcast app. Brought to you by the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver.